On CBC Radio 1, it is 12 minutes after 7 o'clock. For the past three weeks, Metro Morning has been speaking with the top mayoral candidates in the June 26th by-election. Today, we are speaking with Chloe Brown. She came third in last fall's mayoral race, capturing over 6% of the vote. She is also a policy analyst at Future Skills Centre. Chloe is with me in the studio this morning. Good morning. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Let's start, as we have with all of our candidates, with the one-minute elevator pitch. Why are you the best choice for Toronto's mayor? I believe I'm the best choice for Toronto's mayor because I'm the only candidate trying to stand up for the most vulnerable. I'm also the candidate that's trying to do civic education as opposed to running a popularity race because I understand that so many of us do not have a civic education that is at the point where we can engage with multiple levels of government. And for those reasons, I'm hoping the people elect me because my focus has always been elevating the life quality of the working class. And that group has grown. When I was a kid, you can make six figures, have a home, have a family. Now you need seven. And that has happened over the last 15 years. And a a lot of the candidates that I'm facing have been in power during that time. I'm offering a new perspective. I'm offering a chance to elevate new leadership. And ultimately, what I'm trying to do is restore the trust fund that is our public service. So that's why I hope you vote for me. One second left. (laughs) Good use of time. This is your second run for mayor in just six months. And you did run for councillor in 2016 Mm -hmm. against Michael Ford uh, to replace Doug Ford in Etobicoke North. Mm -hmm. But you've not held political office or, or a leadership position. Do you think you have the experience to run a massive organization like the City of Toronto? Yes. (laughs) I know it may sound strange, but the mayor is not as big of a role as the 40,000 civil servants. Why do you say that? Because when it, as a policy analyst, I meet people every day. I write the reports that council asks for and then adopts or chooses to reject. So I've always been working with people. And for those reasons, I believe I'm better suited than someone who's held political office and has been insulated by their staff. So what do you envision the role of mayor to be? I see the role of mayor as being a project manager, a product developer, a coach. Uh, Being a CEO is not really the gold standard of leadership anymore. And as a someone who has their degree in public administration and governance, I've been involved in those very structures, public administration through programs and services, and then governance through a variety of multi-stakeholder projects that I've been asked to deliver. You go for the big job, though, right? The big job of running the city, of heading the city. And some might argue, why not take the more traditional route when it comes to municipal politics, which is starting at the trustee level or even the councillor level? Why did you feel you could you had to avoid that and go for the big job? My ideas are too big for those roles. I've <laughs> To be honest, I worked with Pam McConnell and that's when I realized I didn't want to work in proximity to politicians. I find that they live this very insular controlled life where staff is often doing the work for them and then they just show up to the political theater which is council and then they They participate in these very petty arguments. Meanwhile, objectively, they're not achieving anything. And that's really why I'm not interested in political office, as I'm interested in the policy work that needs to be done. And objectively, it doesn't matter what position you take in government to do it, because in my eyes, it's the city manager who runs the city. It's always been politicians, the lobbyists, everyone in the background running the city. Meanwhile, the politician is the show horse that the public gets to see. So let's talk about your campaign promises that really depend on reorganizing that structure of City Hall. And you've already talked about what your vision of that would be. But some would argue that that would take a lot of time and a lot of money. So how do you balance that kind of massive restructuring with the fundamental problems that the city is facing right now? To the untrained eye, it seems like it could take a very long time, but we live in this age of technology where I've been in I've been in organizations that have been restructuring every year. This idea that it's impossible is really 
it's really coming from the established power who doesn't want to see change. And it's really, for me, a matter of modifying job descriptions. It's a matter of changing project descriptions. These things can be done legislatively, through bylaws, through contract changes. It's not impossible. Um, it's really about the will to get it done. And we've seen how the dysfunction has been really tearing apart our city in terms of providing basic services. Why not make it make sense and bring all these fragmented but similar departments, agencies, boards, and commissions together and make them deliver on one integrated project. So it's not about blowing things up. It's about realignment. Yes. And that's where I think a lot of people have me misunderstood. We have a variety of groups doing very similar projects. Transportation, for instance, you have TTC, transportation services, uh, transportation expansion, and they're all in their little islands. This is why we experience things so broken at the consumer and citizen level, because they're never working in collaboration. They're competitively working against each other. I want to talk about affordable housing, because that has been a dominant issue of this campaign. It's certainly highlighted a number of conversations I've had already on this program this morning. You've spoken about increasing land trusts, which is when land is turned over to a not-for-profit organization who would then own and run the affordable housing. How would you get that affordable housing built and paid for? So I want to do more mixed market, mixed use housing. I'm, I'm a professional. I don't necessarily need subsidized rents. And this is where having that portfolio of social housing that's not government owned is really important to me because as a kid that grew up in Toronto Community Housing, I've watched government after government remove their responsibilities for the maintenance and administration of services to residents. And that decay has led to this current government having a case to sell Toronto Community Housing land. And that's why I'm really focused on land trust, because if you gave land to nonprofit groups, tenants associations, and gave them the power to maintain that land, no matter what government was in place, that land would be taken care of and be made affordable for years to come. So they would run the land, but also run the buildings or the structures yes. on it. Yeah. And they would work with a variety of community groups like YMCA. You have University Health Network, which bought properties in Parkdale, and they're using them for a social medicine campus, otherwise known as a dementia village, where families could live together as opposed to putting their elders in long-term care by themselves. Is this idea... Um exist anywhere else in the world? Yeah. In Madison, in New Hampshire, they have community land trusts. In Wales, in the UK, they use them. And it's just a means of giving non-profit groups land. And that's the biggest issue in the city. We're seeing for-profit condos dominate the real estate sector, and none of us can afford luxury condos, but investors can. And that's why our city feels like a tourist attraction as opposed to a residency. The types of residents that are going up are temporary. They're not of the highest quality. We need long-term tenancies, and that means giving people land. Does the city at this point have the land to make that kind of a system work? Absolutely. I I don't think a lot of us realize, like, Toronto Public Libraries can be built on top of community centers, the TTC stations, the TTC parking lots. We pay for a lot of commercial lands as well. Like, there's one piece of land on Queen Street where a KFC used to be, it's city land. Some of us don't think about it, but the city has a lot of land and they actually have lands that are owned by taxpayers who are not paying taxes for them right now. Property taxes, they're backlogged. So it's like the city can buy, lease and swap land in our name. It's just a matter of signing over the title after it's done because ownership is what really matters. I want to shift to taxes because one of your proposals deals with switching the property tax out with a land use tax. Can mm -hmm. you explain the value of that? So the reason why I'm looking at land value as opposed to property taxes is because of lot size. A lot of us don't take it take into consideration that in Rexdale, a lot size that is not surrounded by amenities is being charged the same as a lot of the same size in Spadina surrounded by amenities. And this is why I want to do a location and land use tax as opposed to property, because 
properties, they change with renovations, they change with um, emergencies. I really just want to look at the land. The land does not change. And that creates a stability in property tax assessments, but it also will look at the amenities around you and take a more accurate location-based assessment. And that's important to me because as a kid growing up in Rexdale, there's no recreation center, there's no park within like 30 minutes. So why am I paying the same price in rental as someone in Spadina who's close to the subway line, who's close to all the amenities? Mm -hmm. Money is such a big part of this mayoral Mm by-election, particularly because the city has a billion dollar shortfall. How would you cover it so the city can function and pay for services? It's a matter of restructuring the city's allocations and looking at the contracts. One project that I'm looking at is the Gardner. The Gardner has become one of the biggest issues in our city, and it's because it's reached the end of its life cycle. It was built in the 70s when my parents were here. The population wasn't as big, but now it can't even fit like the regular commuter. And if you leveled it into an eight-lane boulevard, and made Lakeshore more accessible, you could cut commuting times and make our city more productive. And this is where I went with a strong commissioner's approach as opposed to strong mayors, because when I think of our public boards, they're not filled with working class people that are creating working class solutions. You have a lot of executives who come in and out of the city, but don't use TTC. They Mm -hmm. don't use public parks. And if you have more of them making decisions, the less affordable things will be for us because they're always thinking of that profit-driven motive as opposed to the common good. But we still have this nagging issue of the city's in a big hole financially. For sure. And it's really about giving people housing, giving people better public transit. When I think of myself as an individual, if I could have a better apartment on top of TTC, my cost of living goes down. I can start putting more money back into recreation, parks, etc. But how does that wipe out the deficit for the city? It's a matter of raising my purchasing power. Right now, a lot of us as working class people, we can't afford the cost of living. The rent's high, the groceries are high, and that's why community land trusts are important. If we can bring down the cost of rent, the cost of groceries, because we're giving food co-ops commercial spaces in our community land trust, we bring down the cost of housing, groceries, transportation, data and Wi-Fi when you think of the city-owned fiber optic cables that we could be owning, you give us more assets, And that allows us to have more financial security to pursue businesses, to pursue education, to make the economy more productive. Because in my opinion, the reason why there's a budget hole is because we're spending poorly. We have a Toronto police budget item that's $1.6 million for 3 million people. That's not an effective use of funding in my eyes. And we could be using that for better health programs through Toronto Public Health to raise my ability to go to work regularly. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's really a matter of just supporting the working class so that they're generating more more revenue for the city. You're running a very different campaign. Yeah. What can other candidates learn from you and what you're doing in this campaign? So what I'm trying to do differently is get the 70% of voters that did not feel the need to vote to vote. And I'm seeing I'm seeing the results of that. I'm seeing young people, seniors that haven't voted since the age of 18, telling me, like, for the first time, I feel seen. And for those reasons, I'm going to vote for you. And no matter how strategic other candidates have been saying, like, vote for me if you don't watch how to win. They're like, I'm voting for Chloe because Chloe understands as a working class person, I've been neglected. And for those reasons, I would challenge like existing in new candidates to like stop pandering to people. They're adults. People don't want to be lied to anymore about the state of the city. They don't want to be misled about homelessness, addiction, and all other issues because we have those issues in our families. We want better solutions. So focusing on the problem, saying, oh, the root causes, the root causes over and over, that means nothing to us anymore. We've heard it. What are your solutions? Mm -hmm. And very few candidates have been able to put forward objective solutions as opposed to personal stories. We look at the polls, and I know you've looked at the polls. When you see those numbers, how does a grassroots candidate break through? You focus on your audience. I, In the beginning, I wasn't polling, and now I'm at 5%. 
I'm above or with Bradford. I'm just behind Matt Lowe in certain polls. And it, it's really about focusing on the neglected because that top six is fighting for John's 30% of the vote. I'm fighting for the 70% that's been neglected for decades. And for those reasons, I'm rising in the polls. I have my social media presence. After this, I don't think candidates are going to be able to go back to traditional ways of campaigning. So what is your role after this? Whatever I want, really. <laughs> <laughs> is there a role for you at City Hall? I don't know. To be honest, the public service is bigger than government. And if I wanted to, I could work for the federal government, the provincial. I could become anything I wanted. I only chose to run for this political office to raise awareness about the issues affecting the working class. No one's speaking to the working class. They say middle class instead. Meanwhile, there are a lot of people making fifty, sixty thousand dollars that are feeling poor, but they're employed. And this is the complexity of our identities now that's being missed in favor of easy messaging. My last question, and it's the question that we've asked all the candidates that have sat in the chair that you're in, is what is your message of hope? to the people of Toronto who feel that there is no longer a place for them? I would say that you'd be surprised what a small group of willing and consistent citizens can do for a city. When I was a kid, I grew up in Mike Harris's Ontario, and I grew up with my caretakers and janitors on strike, my teachers on strike, uh, TTC workers, and that's inspired me to this day to continue to fight for myself and to be proud to be a worker. And you're seeing how this plays out with a kid that grew up in Rexdale just trying to be the mayor. And I want more people to realize like you're ready for leadership, even if you don't own a suit, if you don't have the right name or rent to the right school. Do you love your community? Are you willing to fight for them? Are you willing to listen to others? Because that's what makes a leader. It's never been about the aesthetics of leadership. It's always been, are you willing to put your hands in the dirt and plant seeds? And that is that is a message that I've always cherished. And I see it every day on the TTC, in my neighbors. I see it right now in this conversation where it's just like so many of us forget we're powerful. And the only way to remind yourself that you're powerful is this muscle memory that you commit to calling your council every day. You commit to going to the community meeting. And honestly, it's so easy to do. You just have to believe in yourself. I appreciate your time, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you. Chloe Brown is running to be mayor of Toronto. Voting day is just over a week away on Monday, June 26. CBC Toronto will have you covered on election night. Farah Morali and I will be here on CBC Radio with the election night results. There will also be a live streaming special on CBC 